Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, so present in the room here, we have uh, Mark Dunn, chair. Uh, we have Andrew Gnatic, uh, our member at large. And we also have Deborah, I'm sorry, Levitson from um, our senior uh, council on aging. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all right. Well, uh, today um, I'm going to uh, go over a draft document, part of our uh, kind of background information gathering and analysis is to conduct a, a land use survey. So I have a draft document started. Um, it's not complete and there's some data discrepancies that I've begun to identify. So I'm gonna point those out just to clarify where we're at. Uh, welcome any input in terms of data that you all would think uh, would be complimentary, helpful for yourselves and for residents broadly. I brought my uh, you got zoning. zoning map, if that helps anyone. Where I appreciate that. I did not embed a map into this one. There will be some maps attached, but um, yeah. So uh, let me pull up that. So bear with me here, folks. But I don't believe um, don't believe a lot of the information will be new or startling to everybody um, in terms of what we'll be covering. But it's good to just go through it. Uh, we'll take our time today, and then uh, we can open up some conversations. Let me go back to Zoom. Bear with me, everybody. I'm going to share. Uh, Taylor told me that the person from the Conservation Commission that was considering uh, joining us uh, cannot make it at five, but will probably join by Zoom when he has a chance. And I believe that is Brandon. Okay, great. So Brandon will join us. Okay. Uh, thank you. All right. So, um, So for the land use survey, again, this is a draft. Um, uh, not just a, it's not an outline. There's some information there, but there's going to be a lot of uh, data uh, verification. Um, but essentially, this document again is um, for this project intended to provide a quick examination of the land use patterns that we've identified in town. We've a lot of you, especially residents, longtime residents, have seen these patterns emerging. Uh, we'll talk about the existing zoning. Uh, we'll get into a little bit how that zoning has guided density and residential development. Um, we'll reference the uh, Massachusetts Housing Partnerships Residency application. They've um, gathered housing and zoning data across the state and created uh, a cool little tool to investigate communities and neighborhoods. So we'll look at that uh, a little bit. And then um, our final version will include some summaries of model regulations um, that will help inform whatever document we create uh, as a committee and bring to the, um, bring to the community. So I'm just going to pause here. We've got Hadley Media checking in with us. So um, bear with me, Mike and Kayla. Uh, Mike and Kayla, can you all hear through yeah. my computer? Yeah. yeah, I can hear you. Uh, Deb, will you just talk to me real quick? Just make sure. Mike, that sound good? Yeah. Okay. All right. Then we're going to pass on the owl. No worries, Alex. Thank you so much. Uh, all right. If you all can hear us, thank you for bearing with us again and supporting. Um, okay. So uh, we're all set on tech. Back to the document. So um, getting into the land use patterns, um, of course, I think everybody knows population 
um, kind of drives um, development. So um, as population was in increasing early 21st century, a lot of development has been happening, primarily single family homes. Um, projections are for additional population growth, but uh, this past decade, it's kind of stabilized, hovering around um, 5,250 to 5,300. So um, PVPC, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, has conducted some new uh, modeling for population projections. So I'm going to we're going to get some more data. Um, the current projection is for 63, 64, that 100, excuse me, 6,400 uh, by 2030, according to the Donahue Institute. Um, so, the, and those, those projections came out almost a decade ago now. So I'm, I wanted to try to find the PVPC's data and, and verify that. Um, because, you know, as you all think about, development in the in the near future having a clear sense of who all is going to actually be in town and what the needs will be uh that's going to be key yeah, that was that came from i believe the donna donahue institute's first regional housing assessment they've done a regional housing needs report um the first version, it may not be a decade old. It may just be six, seven years. Um, but I believe that's where this first uh, number is 6381. That came from. Oh, um, I didn't get into that just yet. No. Uh, the pattern that this data set suggested was that um, it continued the trend of Hadley growing at a faster rate than the region and the Commonwealth. So, um, so this projection still had Hadley growing at five to 10% over a decade for many decades. And I really don't know, again, this is all pre pandemic data and projections. So I'm going to bring in some more recent uh, projections to get a better sense of what we actually think we're going to need for the town in terms of additional units. Um, the parcel inventory is pretty accurate, but I didn't get, have a chance to confirm exactly. Um, so I'm, I'm going to confer with the board of assessors um, just to get a most recent data set. Uh, the information that the assessors send to MassGIS that then is integrated into the statewide property data, um, that's actually 2021 information. So um, I think there's been some development since then. I don't want to verify that. So we'll have a breakdown of the uh, inventory of parcels, looking at residential, commercial, industrial, what mixed uses are current. Um, we'll get an updated value for the vacant lands. So we're already on the page two here. Uh, so the data that's uh, presented, that comes from the master plan. So that's about eight years old now. So that needs to be verified. Um, Again, connecting with the assessors will give me a better sense of that. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, that would be my understanding. That would be if it's in Chapter 61, A or B, so farmland protection. Um, there's different categories within that. So I think they just call it chapter broadly. Um, yeah, so it, it could be active. Um, cultivation and that also includes forested like silviculture so forest farmland so um so timber lots and the, the like um yeah uh i'll clarify that on the breakdown it's um i was surprised to actually see it uh, broken down the way it was um 
So we'll, I'll go back through and I'll need to bring in the latest data for vacant lands as well. Um, and I'm wanting to bring in, um, so when it comes to land use, there's um, a couple of uh, data sets I wanna also include here. Um, and one of those is actually from the housing production plan in 2020, 2022. Um, just adopted last year. Um, there is um, a bit of a um, narrative and a map on development constraints. So they talk about developability and not developable properties. Uh, so I wanna bring that in as well. That's pretty, uh, that's really the most recent information. So um, I wanna make sure that that map is included because it, it highlights some parcels in the current business and the current industrial zones that I think we'll want to look at uh, in the future. So we'll get into a, a quick overview of zoning as it exists, making sure everyone understands what existing zoning is. Um, the number of districts hasn't changed, but I do want to just, uh, again, verify those uh, acreages. Um, Introduction of those are the same. Uh, the overlay districts, I will spend a little bit more time on. Uh, we introduce four of them. I didn't get an introduction to the newest ones. Um, but we'll, I will want to spend a little bit extra time on the village center overlay. Uh, in my introduction last, our first meeting, we talked about that's really the only current zone in the community that allows for some mixed use. Uh, so I'll pull that out and spend a little bit of extra time just to point out where in the bylaw or how that comes across, kind of what is allowed and um, how it works and maybe how it doesn't work. Um, a small little section on commercial site plan review, I think is helpful, particularly if we think about 40R, if we think about going that route and creating a new overlay, um, there may be a desire to add some caveat for the industrial or the business zones that are the base. Um, so that's just something to be mindful of. What are commercial site plan review procedures? How could that um, either support or um, kind of make uh, development more uh, challenging or uh, burdensome for folks? Um, the zoning map, again, uh, a quick little just blurb to speak to how the zoning districts lay out and um, kind of emerged geographically. Uh, we'll include the zoning map as an appendix so everybody can uh, reference that. And then the, the, the third topic that we'll get into, density, um, that's where we'll start to, I, I added some uh, data from town-wide. So this is uh, according to the residency app, um, uh, a total of 2,289 housing units across the town's nearly 15,800 acres uh, creates an average density, you know, town wide density of only 0.15 units per acre. Uh, but when we start to look at you know, single family homes, which is the vast majority of units in town, uh, 1,666 units on 2,265 acres, that's about 0.74 units per acre. So um, oh, I'm sorry, that's, I guess, wow. Well, I'm going to have to look at how they, the way that they put that information that makes sense to me. So I, I, so acreage. Yeah. Right. 
over the amount of acreage for all of those parcels for for all of those yes yeah, so those one th right but, but that density number of that 15,791 acres some of the acres are right farming or non-developable absolutely right. absolutely mike that's yeah. where that's where We'll try, we'll try to break it down a little bit better. Um, and the, the data set that they have, I haven't gotten all the way through it. Um, they do that. So they'll break down the single unit uh, category. So they'll list single units. Yeah, and so that density total. of 0.15 units per acre is meaning a meaningless number. It doesn't tell us anything. Right, right. Yeah, so that's where I'll build out this narrative a little bit better. Okay. And again, they break it down by single uh, duplex, which there aren't many. Um, they even break it down to like apartments of eight or more units, apartments of eight or less units. Um, so I'll bring that data set in and show kind of how density plays out. Good. And I want to I want to look at density, um, particularly around these um, overlay districts, or uh, particularly along Route Nine. Again, this goes back to the planning board is really focused on looking at the Route Nine corridor as kind of the anchor of any potential mixed use. Uh, thinking about the business and industrial zones along Route Nine. So I think if we really get a better sense of what our Kind of densities around those districts um, gets a sense of what's there, but also, you know, um, what is the context of it, a greater density or even lesser density? Well, if we look at a 40 yard, that's basically prescribes that we be in Route 9, right? I mean, it's, doesn't it, it needs to be on the bus routes. It doesn't have to be. Oh, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be, right. Mm -hmm. um, and really, the the way that um, to my understanding, uh, the Office of Housing and Livable Communities would look at what they call concentrated development for Hadley um, versus uh, transit-oriented um, qualifications. Um, because Hadley doesn't have a bus um, depot or, um, yeah, so that they would just refocus and look at a different category yeah um yeah so density i do want to tease out i want to look at those single family homes particularly and then um look at some of the multifamily that does exist you know, again recognizing it's not a big percentage but it's good to get a sense of um you know for the apartment complexes that are eight units or more uh, you know, how many are those? What does that break down to units per acre? So people get a sense of, you know, when they, like units per acre isn't really something that people think about. Um, it's easy to think about when you have a single family unit on an acre, but when you see an apartment complex, you're like, well, what does that actually mean? Um, I think that'll be helpful uh, to just let residents get a sense of what, what is existing, what is really dense housing. Um, the last section that this document will uh, include is uh, an introduction and summary to at least three model bylaws that I've identified, I think will be helpful to the steering committee to, to be introduced to and get a sense of. Uh, the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission has two that um, they're still relatively um, current. A lot has changed in the last decade, but these there's two um, model bylaws that the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission has drafted over the last decade, uh, focusing primarily on mixed use development, a second that's more specific to infill. Um, and then w there is a model bylaw for a 40R district that comes from Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities. I'll summarize that as well and then attach it as an appendix. So everybody will get a, a, a copy of those documents to, to start thinking about. 
because that's really the kind of the framework that will will build Hadley's smart growth regulations around. You know, it may take the form of um, a mixed use zone. It may take the form of a 40R overlay that's much more complex. Um, so or, I just want to make or or it may take no form. <laughs> right, you're, you're right, Mike. It, it right, could be right. We, we can't be proceed a, on the assumption that this is a done deal. <laughs> right. Um, but I just want to make sure that the Got steering it. committee early on, before we really start getting uh, input from the community, kind of knows the avenues that you have in, in front of you. Yeah. And when you say input from the community, you mean these sessions, so-called sessions? Yeah. So whatever public engagement we do, that'll be our yeah. input. Um, Deb has a quick question, though. Yeah, yeah. That's, I can't yeah. hear. The, uh, the, so Deb's bringing up the the question of the mall broadly. I think that's kind of what Kyle was talking about when he said if we overlay the industrial or the commercial, you know, that we could put caveats or sit, you know, so it would lay over where the mall is. Right. If we wanted to consider that we could then include stipulations to limit what we'd like that to, or would like that to look like. Right. So right. I, I can't speak for the uh, owners of the mall pyramid, but they've been known to uh, pull this type of bankruptcy thing, uh, foreclosure thing, and use it as a negotiating ploy to renegotiate the terms of their loans. So just keep that in the back of your mind. This is may all be smoke and mirrors. It's good to know. I appreciate that insight into the, the wheelings and dealings behind the scenes for, yeah. Right. So, so um, if we were to think about the hypothetical of the mall changing in the near future, um, yeah, determining, through the steering committee meeting with residents and getting input, you know, eventually it will be up to the steering committee to decide, do you want to create a new category of use, the new zoning district, which would be mixed use, right? So that would by right allow someone to have a home and have a business of some kind simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Um, and that could just be by right. You know, I have a parcel. I can have houses and businesses intermixed, however I like. Or create something like an overlay similar to um, the senior housing or the village center where um, mixed use might be a right, but it has to meet ABC criteria. Um, affordability would be a required component of that. You know, twenty percent of total units would have to be affordable, um, and that becomes its own um, overlay guidelines that a mall could say we're going to ignore the overlay because we still just want to have a mall. So there, there's kind of considerations to take into account when you think about the final product and that's, you know, that's a little bit further down the road. You could still have a mall and still have an overlay district because it would allow right. flexibility in the future. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it, with an overlay, the mall could stay as it is. Yeah. And that kind I of thing. Understand that the takes precedence. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Sure. So, so t yeah, so typically overlays are more restrictive. Um, in the case of 40R, it is, but it can't, the way that the legislation has been shaped, a 40R overlay um, has to be allowed to opt, a developer can opt out of it, of those extra regulations and go back to the base. So it's it's kind of a unique thing. Um, 
to my understanding, you know, most overlays are more restrictive and you, you can't really get out of it. Like the floodplain overlay in town, you, you can't really get around those extra pro, um, um, prohibited uses. You just, so can they, can they pick and choose? Say Could they, let's say the underlying district didn't allow housing, mm -hmm. the 40 yard uh, uh, overlay did, they could use the 40 yard and then ignore it and go to the base. Right. So the question is, uh, could the 40 R be ignored if the base is business, for example, um, to my understanding, a developer could choose not to put in housing. No. Right. But I'm saying if they were going to put in housing in within the 40 R zone, right. They overlay, right. They would have to follow all of those stipulations. If they're doing housing, if they're doing housing, if they're trying to do a use that the base zoning not. prohibits. Yeah. So if the business zone prohibits housing, right. residential use, they would need to follow the smart growth to put housing in on the parcel. If they weren't interested in housing at all, they could just opt out and just continue business as usual. I'm just trying to, you know, if anyone out there was watching this Absolutely. later and saying, could they use the overlay to get into that district and then not use the overlay? <laughs> rules and build housing but if it's not allowed underneath they can't pick and choose they have to either use right one. right yeah yeah so um yeah so i'll um going back to this draft a, a lot more information i want to include um i want to make sure again getting the, the latest data set because a lot has been happening in town these last few years, particularly. Uh, and I think this is something that residents want the latest information. They want a clear picture of what they're talking about. So uh, I just need to backtrack and, and double check a few things. Um, and I'll make sure that the, the density discussion is really focused on those residential areas, uh, getting a sense and trying to... Um, help residents understand kind of what, what is common, most common uh, across town, and then what are kind of the extremes in terms of what is the most dense parcel or development in town. And, you know, that just helps when we decide to engage with the public, that just helps folks understand kind of that concept. Because it's part of 40R when you start to think about a higher density, they allow, um, they allow for and actually require a certain amount of density. So uh, I think single single family, I think it's eight units per acre. So that's uh, one house per 5,000 square feet or so. A little bit. So, uh, you know, right. the, the, the house side grew up. That's, that's a, that's a, that's a minimum density. So, so, you know, people, yeah. So, you know, squeezing eight units onto a house at least. Um, if not more. So, Sorry, the Mike. House, the house I grew up in in North Hadley on River Drive is a Cape built in 49. There's two, one tobacco shed, another barn. They replaced one that burned down, but the whole plot there was part of the farm, and it's probably four acres. So right. you've got one unit on four acres, and does that go into that density calculation of 0.19? I, I would think the way that they did this calculation is they compared t number of units to the uh, total acreage of that parcel. Yeah. So, so I a, think it's a farm, you know? So, yeah, it's, okay. it's, it's, uh, it's not a, it's, it's, it's an interesting new tool, um, and I'm happy to break it down a little bit better. That's okay. Um, I'm also happy to find, you know, if we if there are uh, parcels that folks know um, well, you know, then it's like, okay, this is this is a standard um, or a 
a more common residence in town. This is the lot. This is kind of the, the density that people are used to. If there's a particular apartment complex where you're like, this is one of the larger ones in town, you know, that helps just paint a yeah. clear picture for folks. I think you've got to look at houses that were built under the 150 or 170 foot frontage to, mm. be, to look at density rather than some of these ancestral farms like the yeah. West farm or because it doesn't right. make any sense. Okay. Yeah. No, that's, that's a good point, Mike. Thank you. Um, yeah. I mean, when you start to look at housing, particularly it's, it's interesting um, you, because housing production and development has come in waves. Um, um, when you have so many units built, um, you know, 1970s and later, um, those are all going to be shaped by zoning where most units built, you know, pre 1960 or they're not going to be impacted by zoning. Um, can't remember exactly when the town adopted zone for the first time. I think it was 61 around early sixties. So yeah, you're right, Mike, that, you know, the older town, the older, uh, residents, you know, they're, they're, they're going to be in a very different pattern of development than these subdivisions that we see since then. Um, so this document will get built out a little bit more. Um, hopefully, you know, it's, it'll still be relatively short. The appendices will be rather long with those model bylaws attached. Um, but it's really to try to give us a best sense of what the town has been experiencing, experiencing these past few decades and um, what feels right when we think about future development and the density of that. I'll stop sharing now if we don't have questions. Because that leads us into our next topic, which is really just um, more of a conversation regarding public engagement. Um, and no need to make a decision right now. I know we are at the beginning of June and uh, the original timeline said that we would try to do public engagement. Our first attempt would be this month. Um, we're getting close to summer vacation. We're getting close to summer vacations for those not in school, <laughs> you know, that broader communities like to take breaks uh, and enjoy the warm weather. Tra typically engagement isn't very successful in the summer months. Um, that's not to say that it, it can't be. Uh, our other community that's going through a very similar project uh, had their first public engagement May 20th. And that was a very warm Monday in uh, the senior center in East Long Meadow. And they had 85 or so attendants, more than anticipated. So it's not to say that you won't get a good turnout. It's just, you know, getting the word out. Um, but also that was for a large community event with an educational presentation at start, uh, and then series of facilitated conversations and breakouts, um, typically called charrette. Um, that's just one way of engaging with the public. That was a two hour event. It's helpful. It gets a good sense of what people are looking for or are not looking for in terms of, you know, what, what density or intensity of development feels appropriate, uh, what concerns they have with walkability uh, or just pedestrian friendly um, or alternatives to the car. Um, also got a little bit into, you know, how to preserve or what kinds of open space look um, look good, feel appropriate for a more concentrated development. Um, we don't necessarily have to go that route. We can do a survey, we can do focus groups. At this point, I'm more open to see what people are inclined to explore. We have surveys from the housing production yeah. um, that are pretty recent of like 2022. Right, yeah. Uh, so happy to incorporate that. Um, we can use some of those, some of that feedback in terms of guidance. 
Um, I think a survey right now, um, I don't necessarily have a sense of how big that would be or how comprehensive would that would be. Surveys are tough because you want to keep them succinct. You want to keep them to five, 10 minutes at most for people to conduct and answer everything. Um, there's also the opportunity of focus groups. I know that um, even, you know, the different uh, committees that are represented by members of the steering committee, you know, might have insight, insight that they want to offer. Um, it might be worthwhile to consider, you know, an event just for the seniors or just for the Council on Aging community. Um, might be an opportunity to invite uh, the Housing and Economic Development Subcommittee or any focus groups that they've identified. Um, just throwing out ideas there. But we've got the Housing Production Plan Survey that we can incorporate. Uh, any other ideas? or interest. Not done this, but I mean, I could imagine to draw people out in a busy viewing, maybe we could uh, have some, yeah, I, I think we'd get more uh, input if we had some kind of a hybrid um, borrowing, like, in, in the big room here, you know, invite people to come into the air conditioned space. Maybe, I don't know, maybe have some light fare. To oh, I, I think you're going to get people to come out if you can create a hot topic, make this a hot topic. I mean, and it's Truth. not a hot topic. I mean, even if you can develop some controversy around it. Uh, but I don't know how to do that, but it's just my observation. Well, before we think about what's the best way to do it, like what is the purpose of this engagement? What's the goal? What is the goal? Why are we doing it? Are we doing this to take the temperature of those who come out to see if they're pro? affordable housing or not, and if they're pro where, and if they're against it, are they against it everywhere or against it in, you know, does that sound like what you would anticipate, Kyle, or? I think, um, I think that's a critical part of the first engagement is a lot of it is gonna kind of just be tech. Um, it's gonna be, be very broad. Um, our, our event down in East Longmeadow, again, like we try to take it back a step, we try to go to like 35,000 feet, give a broad overview of the project uh, and really just get a sense of what residents uh, were thinking about in terms of certain aspects of a smart growth district. Again, focusing on uh, housing, uh, what housing types seem to fit. Uh, we talked about uh, economic development. We talked about businesses that were are there what businesses are missing, what would be more attractive to bring people to a mixed use district or keep people there for longer. Um, talked about open space, um, not only protecting what is around their district or pro proposed district, but also, you know, how do you, um, how do you do small things to add open space or just add a little bit of green space to your more intense development. Uh, and then we also talked about um, historic and cultural uh, resources. So kind of landmarks, areas that you would want to make sure that um, don't get too encroached upon or um, redeveloped, you know, if it's got a, a particular value to the community. So those were the topics that we discussed. Um, a lot of the conversation was a lot of the start of the conversation was breaking down rumors that uh, Mike, we, we made that one a hot topic <laughs> yeah. quite, quite accidentally at our first meeting when there was a big misconception of um, 40R and that, you know, that community, many uh, misunderstood and thought 40R was the path that the town had decided. 
that's not the case. They're exploring it very similar to what Hadley's attempting to do. But, um, so. Well, the, there's, as Mike said, there's a chance we, as a committee, may decide, nope, none of that stuff. Right. But more likely, we're going to find if anything was going to work, what could it be? And we bring that is we're we have no power other than to bring something to vote. So right. we're not shoving no, anything, exactly. We're not shoving anything down anyone's throat. No. Our our right. marketers right. to do the advance work and say we went through the buffet and this was what we think has the best chance of getting support from the town people. And yeah. they say, yeah, and yeah. Right. Absolutely. Well, I, I think we should set up a community involvement this month. I mean, you know, the su summer isn't here yet. Why don't you? Well, if we could turn back it? time, we could have a booth at the uh, Asparagus Festival. But we, oh, that's that. That's we missed that. Uh, yeah. yeah. I think uh, having a few focus groups is not a bad idea. A few? In, okay. In the lead up to a larger meeting or some other way. Yeah, I mean. The way we frame it is right. going to be very important. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's not, I think it's just a technical presentation. We're going to get back and raw, raw reactions, like not necessarily. Um, well, yeah, I, th I think the way you frame it, one of the ways you frame it is that in or order for Hadley to continue to grow and prosper, you need affordable housing. And because of the nature of Hadley, we're going to have to increase densities in certain parts of town. Um, yeah. I think that's... Uh, I agree. You know, I've always said, go up, not sideways, go up. Uh, and and then we still have them options. You can go, like Mike says, you can go up in where there are existing uh, structures, or you can yeah. do in, you can do infill in certain areas. Right. And you can cluster, or you can yeah. separate. Right. You can you can discuss regional need, needs and why the state is even offering for right now. Right. There's a lot of different issues, and some are more controversial, and some are not. And it seems to me that's an important piece of work we should do. Right. And smaller group conversations might be helpful in learning what the best approach for that is. Yeah, yeah. And it, and it all comes down to the economics of this potential development. Is 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 it going to be more economic to? do mixed use development than to put another target in or whatever. Uh, it's all return on equity because you're not going to get anything unless you get a developer stand up, step up and say, Hey, I want to do this. True. Um, <clears throat> but <clears throat> going back to the idea of possibly doing some, so a combination of focus groups and a large kind of, um, a larger forum for the residents, <clears throat> I think um, I like the idea of the combination. I think to do a series of focus groups first could lead to a more direct type of questioning and engagement for the broader community. Um, that might be easier to... <clears throat> um, schedule and facilitate over the summer months wow. getting smaller groups uh, lined up and on a schedule and then just putting the larger what happened town-wide um, um events kind of later summer early fall that could be a way to do it um there was um there is a recent write-up in business west about um, the work along Route 9. <clears throat> and I believe the select board member, I can't remember her name, um, Sally, Sally? I could be wrong. I'm sorry. There's Amy Parsons. 
Joyce, Molly Keegan. Molly Keegan. There we go. Okay. Molly, not Sally. Excuse me. Yeah. Excuse me, Molly. Uh, she was interviewed for uh, a piece on on uh, in Business West magazine, talking about the um, um, infrastructure and the road work along Route Nine. Uh, and she, in that article, she mentioned Forty R. So um, she there's also part of the there and yeah she's in wealth development and she's been in town you know uh, town government for a while for a while yeah. and you know i i wouldn't, wouldn't say forever she doesn't <laughs> she doesn't rank up there with joyce chungo but uh, yeah 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 okay. but uh, yes yeah, she's very knowledgeable and she's also in um I don't know how she finds time, but she was also uh, sat in on the um, UMass design group when they were looking and uh, what's their name from the the mall manager was there right. to uh, work with UMass when their uh, design students were looking at possibilities right. for the mall. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so she's... Well, right. You know, Justin had mentioned um, that the that committee. Um, yes. Um, they are planning some type of public forum also mm-hmm. on housing, and he had suggested some coordination there, which makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, but absolutely. It's you know, it's a little bit parallel to what we're doing. No, I I would consider that exactly parallel. I mean. Um, yeah. I wonder if they'd be interested in, in the approach that you're, you know, possibly laying out know, for yeah. some smaller meetings over the summer and then a major forum. Well, I was probably if we wanted to get in, but I was wondering, might be asking a lot, but if, if we could do both, if we could have a, a, and maybe stagger them by a week. So if someone takes a week vacation and they miss the, small groups option one Mm -hmm. week, then they could come to the more larger forum the next, you know, just give, you might get double coverage. Some people come to both, right? but uh, I'm just trying to think of how you kind of scattershot and give, you know, there will be people that, oh, that's the week that we're away for, you know, graduation or wedding or whatever. So, um, and then the second round, which is in the fall, the second eng- engagement, engagement um, that's more bringing back what we've brought out, or yes, uh, yeah, so this is kind of initial input and then uh, critical, constructive criticism on what we bring forward. Absolutely, okay. yeah. So, the so, um, the second round of engagement, which would be uh, later, um mid late fall uh, would be taking feedback that you take gather from focus groups or residents at large um, report back what, you know, preferences you've uh, gathered from them. Uh, and then I would think you would want to present at that point, kind of your, your thinking in terms of what regulation would look like. If it would be just a recommendations of minor changes to the bylaws, if it's a recommendation of a, you know, there's uh, a new zoning that people are asking for, and this is what we think people are interested in, or 40R seems to be what people are really interested in, and this is what we're going to really want to advance, um, at least then get a sense of where the residents are, and you can also get it feedback on, on that regulation. Draft regulation, you know, it's it's far from done at that. Even at that point, it's far from done. Um, I wonder, and maybe done this, or maybe see the laws in it. What if we had a a short online survey with maybe you know four, six, eight questions, and then a open comment box? 
and we uh, that would allow people that can't make a meeting to put their thoughts in, but they would have to identify. Uh, you know, they would have to to take the survey. They would have to say, you know, their name and address, so that we know right. that they're having yeah. residents yeah. and that they're only doing it once. They're not, you know, stuck in the box. Right, right. You know? yeah. But that might be something that some people might. Uh, might be able to find time for a five minute survey. Yeah. And I think I think that combined with focus groups, the one or two focus groups and a and one grand attempt at a I don't know how we do that. Right. Um that way I'm just thinking I don't want someone to say you didn't really try to get our input. Right. I I, I want to try to harvest. Um, and so I'm just trying to think how we can catch the most you know, input. Yeah. Uh, I We're working on a survey for a similar project. I'm happy to come back with the draft for if we want to do just kind of a broad, uh, like you said, four, five, six questions just to get people thinking and then open a comment. Uh, we can set up a, a logic that you know, if people aren't residents, they'll just get kicked out and they can't come back in. But and there might be uh I mean I don't know, Kayla probably knows could probably speak better to this, but I don't know that we could set that up on our website, but maybe there are websites out there for surveys that you know, like a survey monkey or something like that, where we um you know have them there's a link from our web page that takes them there. Yeah. And then their results come back to us so that, yeah. you know, you know, some of already, you know, created that wheel. Right. Yeah. It's trying to fold that into our small town website. We'd be asking a lot. Right. But to utilize a web survey page where we could set up, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as an, I, I don't know how the group feels. I, mean, I think at this early stage, I mean, it would take a lot of thought about how to set up those questions. Right. And they need to be pretty just open ended. Right. Just early. I wouldn't want to, it's so easy to foreclose in a, in a survey, you know, to kind of be too specific. People to what they but um I mean I, I like the idea of having another way for people to participate um, but maybe with broader open-ended questions yeah I mean in the in the housing production plan committee like there's like a lot of responses that are based touching on exactly what we're trying to figure out right um so I mean, it was a small response, though, I think. It was 271. Oh, was it? Um, I mean, it wouldn't take much to, like, even if we made the uh, survey, like, mobile-friendly and just utilize QR codes. Um, yeah. It's, it's, I know it sort of limits some, some interaction, um, but could even include, like, a link or something. Yeah. People aren't comfortable with QR codes. Yeah. Um, typically, Pioneer Valley, when we build our surveys for projects, we tend to use um, SurveyMonkey. Um, we, our standard protocol is to create a QR code so that that's an option. Folks can just scan and go right to it. Yeah. Um, it gives us a chance to, um, you know, we can capture and analyze feedback as it comes in. We can close a survey down, we can reopen it. Um, takes the burden off of the town to manage and compile everything. And if we wanted to do hand physical surveys, we can deliver a stack to um, Council on Aging or library or somewhere else and you know gather those up when we're ready and we can just put them all in at once. Um, 5% for a community survey isn't too bad, really. It's not, you know, it doesn't sound great, but 5% is pretty good. That's a bad, we got the 271, I was thinking that was probably in that range. Right, that's what it's it, about 20 times off, is it? 
Right. Is it always necessary to have community surveys and community input because it be as you just suggested it becomes skewed mm. it doesn't necessarily reflect the, the, the general consensus of the community but just of only a few right. few a certain sector right um that's where it's it's a fair question mike um engagement is gonna have to happen you know, for the project, that's part of the project. So we're going to engage with the broader community. Um, it's up to the committee how you think that is best done. Um, because you get a limited input, either through a survey or through a, a single live event, you know, you're always going to be skewed by who actually shows up to participate uh, versus who doesn't. My personal um, professional opinion is, offer a variety, stagger those opportunities, try to just make as big of a net as possible to capture as many people as can. Um, I do want to just recognize it's 6.07. I know we got started a little late, yeah. but we were trying to keep things to an hour. Um, there may be times when, and I don't know if you can predict what meetings we might need to be an hour and a half. Or yeah. Um, I'm thinking the next one we may want to carve out a little extra time. Um, what I'm going to prioritize for the next meeting, which would be in two weeks on the 20th, 20th, no, sorry, 17th, 14 and 3, 17th. Um, uh, we'll have a, a final or near final version of the survey, land use survey and summary. Uh, and then I'll, I can have a draft of, you know, kind of that broader survey if we want to use that as, you know, our first prong in our engagement strategy. I can have those draft questions ready. Um, the committee can look at it, see if that's gets the information that you're wanting to get now or if it's too early. We can get a sense of it then. What about a proposal for smaller group meetings over the summer. Oh yeah, um, I can uh, I can do that. I'll likely reach out to Justin uh, to connect to see what they're already thinking about since their uh, task is very similar. Uh, if there are events that they're already planning, we'll see about coordination. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. What's um, the open, just to touch on any questions on open meeting law, um, what you can't, what violates open meeting is when you have a conversation that involves a quorum, which would be four people. And that also includes in series. So if you had, you asked me and we had a, a discussion about our thoughts and then, and then the next day you spoke to someone else and someone, you know, if you had the same discussion individually with three other members, that would constitute a quorum and that would violate. Um, or, you know, if there's a quorum standing out in the parking lot after the meeting talking about it, that's what um, is, that's what causes a violation of the state law. Uh, but uh, we uh, we were new to this when I was on the, when I joined the diversity committee. And what we found is we can set up a subcommittee of less than a quorum that can go off. And because you know, we, for our first year, we just, we just met monthly and felt like we were at, going at a snail's pace. Yeah. But you could set up two or three people to focus on something and bring it to the next meeting. So if you want to, sure. um, that's perfectly fine. You know, there's nothing that says you can't talk. You just can't have a group, uh, a quorum. Right. Does that make sense? I'm not sure, but it, I think if you're saying you can have a subcommittee and they yeah. can talk to each yeah. other. Yeah. Just or, they're not or, just, or just informally have a conversation with one or two people, just not with three, because then yeah. you and the three make the quorum. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like, I guess if, if there could be some sort of subcommittee conversation, right. 
that doesn't violate that problem. Um, I'd be interested in having that being part of that conversation. Particularly about engagement? Early framing. Or framing questions? Early yeah. Engagement. Okay. I think this is where we, I think it's an important moment. Right, absolutely. I, I support that. And uh, as a non-voting member, of the, you know, I'm just a resource. So if um, fewer than the quorum were interested in having a conversation, I would be uh, free to talk to you as, as needed. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, I would invite people to uh, either, you know, you don't have to wait till the next meeting. If you have questions or thoughts, you could bounce them off of Kyle and me. Yep. And that's only involved. I mean, that's getting his information and I'm only one other person and I can receive from everybody and not share to right. attribute that. But we can try to keep individually moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. If that seems like Yeah. Uh, I encourage that again. I, you've you've emailed me, right? I think everybody should, hopefully knows I'm an email away. I do my best to respond uh, promptly. If you don't end up in my junk folder, I, I check that hourly. Uh, but um, um, yes, I think if if you're particularly interested, or anyone viewing on the committee particularly interested in a topic share it with Mark and I and we can bounce off some ideas and then yeah. we're not in any violation of open yeah. meeting law. Or and if you go talking to any of your peer groups or just so many and you come up with an idea, this would be a good idea for engagement. Please, yes. We bounce it off Kyle and me. Yes. <laughs> So, uh, so I've got three things that I'll be bringing to our next steering committee meet, meeting. Um, a more finalized land use survey document uh, with some zoning assessment. Um, a draft survey, very brief but high high end uh, high level, uh, and um, some more information on perspective. Uh, possible focus groups engaging with with specific uh, stakeholders or constituents. Mm -hmm. um, that next meeting would be in two weeks, Monday the 17th. Um, please try to schedule for an hour and a half. Hopefully uh, it'll go quicker. Uh, and I'll try to get everything out. Uh, beforehand since we have a, a full agenda so folks can look at it before we have our meeting. I just want to share that I will make every effort to be here in person at that meeting, but there's you know things failing under normal. I have to go out that weekend to hike with my daughter for Father's Day Great. up around Mount Washington. So my plan is to hike out Monday morning and it's only a three hour drive so I should definitely be here by five but it's Fair enough. Well, not, just make sure we don't have to send search parties out for you. Well, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully not from Mount Washington. <laughs> but uh, all right. Um, well, that's all for me. I don't want to hijack the meeting. It's not mine to to run. But well, that's thanks. all I've got. Thanks, Kyle. You're doing an exceptional job. Are you going to be at the planning board meeting tomorrow? No, not tomorrow. You're too busy. No. You don't. You okay. don't have room for me. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the 18th. That's. I'll have a lot for you then. Uh, but I think that's all we've got on the agenda for today. Okay. Well, good night. Right. Andrew, any other thoughts? Uh, no, I can send out the. Housing production question questionnaire answers if uh, people want those. Oh, thank you. That'd be yeah. great. You Send those out after. Thank you. Andrew's going to share the results from the housing production plan, sir. Yeah. So, just so you know. Do we know? He was. Okay. All right. All right. Do you need a motion? Yeah. Motion to adjourn. I will list to review. Our next meeting is the 17th at 5 o'clock. Yep. We will be
big here, and there will be a Zoom link. Yep. Um, I do want to say that we uh, we seem to have worked out the bugs with the uh, uh, with the posting. Although I was slow this time on getting to review the agenda, I'll try to get better about that. Um, but I do think the next thing we need to improve, and, and, and maybe I can take that on, is sending reminders out to people maybe the Friday before, because I got uh, Randy Eiser said, oh, I didn't know that we had a meeting. So um, reminders are good, because we all have a lot going on. Yep. And he's on the select board, so he has a lot going on. Yeah, right. so, I to yeah I, 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 I was... I figured out that I could find the link on the uh, town clerk's website, and I, that's how I got here tonight. Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, All right. Reminders. Okay. Do that. Great. Right. So I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. A second? Second. A uh, second from East Commons. <laughs> All in favor will go All by right. uh Mike. He's heard Mr. Sarsinski say aye. Uh, aye. aye. And Mark, I say aye. Aye. Deborah says aye. And I think that's all for our voting members, right? That's it. That's everybody. Okay.